Rat killing combined with basic measures of sanitation and rat proofing constitutes a major step in rat control. But rat killing by itself does not result in permanent rat control. So long as food sources and harborage remain undisturbed, killing rats merely lessens competition for those that survive. With less competition, rapid reproduction rebuilds the population. Soon the infestation is as great as ever. When a building has been rat-proof to keep rats out, it is possible to eliminate all rats within the premises by the techniques of rat killing. It is the rat eradicator's job to get rid of every last remaining rat. One surviving pregnant female might cause a reinfestation that would completely nullify the effort and expense of rat proofing. The tools of rat killing are various rodenticides and mechanical devices. Selection and use of these tools depends upon the area to be rat proofed. For instance, in this restaurant kitchen, no chances should be taken with a poison that rats might spread to human food. In this case, red squill is selected as the rodenticide. Red squill is relatively safe around humans and most domestic animals, since it is in itself an emetic and is usually regurgitated before lasting harm is done. But the rat cannot regurgitate and retains the poison. Red squill is bitter and must be mixed with food that is highly acceptable to rats. A poison bait is prepared of rolled oats, ground bacon, and red squill. Salad oil is added as a binder. The mixture is prepared in small amounts called torpedoes for distribution to the rats. When a variety of bait is used, each is wrapped in contrasting paper. Thus the eradicator can learn which bait the rats prefer. To kill as many rats as possible before they develop an aversion to the poison, a generous supply of bait is used. Bait is placed along runways and near customary sources of food. Rats seek food where they have previously found it and are usually suspicious of any change. Rats usually eat a full meal only in the safety of their harborage. Therefore, torpedoes are made in a convenient size for rats to carry away for later eating. Each torpedo contains enough rodenticide so that if shared by two or three rats, each will receive a lethal dose. When a rat has eaten red squill, it soon becomes lethargic. Four to 14 hours later, tremors begin, followed by progressive paralysis. Death occurs within 72 hours, usually in the nest. A checkup in the restaurant kitchen two days after setting out the poison reveals lessened rat activity. A definite odor of dead rat guides the eradication man to one of the rat casualties. When rats die in places from which removal is impractical, the use of an odor masking preparation is often advisable. Here, isobornal acetate is used as the masking agent. The best way of finding out whether any living rats remain is to put down some patches of talc or 10% DDT dust to make rat tracks easily visible. Patches approximately 12 by 18 inches and 1 8 inch thick are spread and smoothed. Smoothing will make it easier to see tracks more clearly. Tracks found in such patches indicate the presence or absence of rats, as well as the size and number of rats using the runway. The tracking patches are laid along the rat's principal routes between food, water, and harborage. Only when an adequate number of properly placed patches 
are free from rat tracks for five consecutive nights, can the premises be considered rat free? Early the next morning, the patches are examined with a flashlight before the kitchen is cleaned for use. The first two patches are smooth. This patch clearly shows tracks of several rats. Obviously the job is not yet completed. Therefore, the rat control man prepares another rodenticide, possibly AN2 or arsenic trioxide, to complete the kill. A quick-acting, highly toxic rodenticide, such as 1080 water, can be used only when the premises can be closed off to humans and animal pets. It is necessary to cut off all sources of water in the area and rely on the rat's thirst to compel them to take a waterborne poison. 1080 water is placed in waterproof, non-spillable cups. 1080 is a dangerous poison and should be used only by trained eradication men. Rats must have water. 1080 water is tasteless, odorless, and quite acceptable to them. One swallow is a lethal dose. 1080 kills within one half to two hours. Convulsions precede death by heart failure. The next day, used cups and carcasses must be counted, picked up, and disposed of. Dead rats and used cups must be incinerated. Only qualified eradication men should be permitted to use 1080, and then only under careful supervision. This basement storage room has been rat-proofed, but its rat population has to be exterminated. Warfarin is selected as a rodenticide. Warfarin is an anticoagulant causing a slow bleeding to death. It is tasteless and odorless. One effective bait to use with warfarin is cornmeal mixed with a discoloring agent to warn against human use. Warfarin mixed with yellow cornmeal and charcoal is placed in a bait box near a rat entrance. The purpose of the bait box in this case is not to prevent human access, but to prevent accidental spilling. Warfarin does not create an aversion in rats that eat it. They often show a preference for warfarin in cornmeal over unpoisoned foods. A tracking patch is spread around the bait box. Another bait box is located near a place where the rats have fed in the past. During the night, rats are attracted by the bait and approach the box. As no other food is easily available, they investigate and find the bait to their liking. The next day, examination of the tracking patch shows the rat's reaction to the bait. They have eaten so much that it is necessary to replenish the supply. The effect of warfarin is cumulative. Repeated doses gradually weaken the rat by loss of blood. The rat usually dies between the fifth and eighth day. Despite its safety features, warfarin must be used with caution and placed in locations inaccessible to humans and animal pets. For 10 days after the last rat was found dead,
there had been no new tracks found around the box. Yet another patch near the rat entry hole shows the tracks of more than one surviving rat. The eradicator decides to use steel traps. He selects one, carefully sets it at hair trigger, and places it at an opening to rat harborage. Because a steel trap does not kill outright, it must be securely fastened so the rat cannot drag it to his harborage. To force the rat to cross the trap, the eradicator puts a box on each side. The boxes are pushed back against the platform to keep the rat from turning aside to bypass the trap. Next morning, inspection shows that one rat has been caught in a trap and is still alive. Another trap has evidently been sprung and dragged around, but there is no rat in it. The tracking patch near the rat entry reveals a rat's footprints. Now that the rats have been made shy of steel traps, expanded trigger wood traps are prepared and placed in rat runs and near food. A rat is caught, probably the last one. Thereafter, as in all rat-free premises, inspections must be made at regular intervals. For this purpose, tracking patches provide a permanent inspection record. There are other types of rodenticides, and with time, more will be developed. But regardless of the rodenticide used, safety for human beings and domestic animals, as well as effectiveness against rats, must be considered. For greater safety, an emetic can be added to many rodenticides. Dangerous poisons with which emetics cannot be used should be handled only by qualified personnel under conditions that present no peril to human beings or harmless animals. By observing proper rat killing techniques, rat proof premises can be completely freed of rats and kept that way.